What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Locked On Reds podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm your host, Jeff Carr. Today, we've got a packed podcast for you. We're going to talk about a great weekend in New York for the Cincinnati Reds. We're going to ask the question, and I have some thoughts on the question itself, did the front office do enough. We're going to talk about that. And I want to kind of take a look back at last August, see what the Reds have to compare themselves to. And let's appreciate Kyle Farmer a little bit. Lots to get to. We're going to get to all of it here in a minute. But first, we got to start it off right with this intro. The Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for finding the Locked On Reds podcast today. If you're watching here on the YouTube channel for the first time, make sure you hit that subscribe button. That way you don't miss anything I've got for you. Plus, if you're listening on the podcasting app of your choice, make sure you follow me there. I'm on pretty much every single podcasting app with the Locked On Reds podcast, your team, every day. Today, we got a lot. I mean, note sheet. You can kind of see it. Yeah, a lot. A lot on there. We got a lot to talk about because the Reds did good in New York. It was good to see them win a series. It was the first time since May of 2013 that the Reds won a series against the Mets in Flushing, Queens, there in New York. If you live in New York, Flushing, Queens, whatever. I I don't know if people get offended by just calling it New York. It's kind of big. It's a lot bigger than Cincinnati. Whatever. The Reds did well. And unfortunately, Joey Votto didn't make history. I told you to maybe take that bet on Saturday. Didn't quite work out. He was inches away. So close. He should have had it. In fact, he even talked about it in the post game. He's like, my streak began with almost a weekly hit pop fly. I was on 98 mile an hour exit velocity that just happened to go out of Great American Ballpark. And then my streak ends on a 113 mile an hour line drive off the wall. That's baseball, baby. Love it. I I was happy to see, though, he sets the team record officially seven games. Joey Votto has the most the the longest streak in Reds history. He's going into the Hall of Fame. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind. If there's any doubt in your mind, love to hear why, because you're wrong. All right. Let's talk about Sunday's game. The game that wrapped it up. Goody looked good. Four and two thirds of no hit baseball. He gives up a single, but he is able to kind of get around what happened in the sixth inning because he gets through the fifth inning, just the one hit. The sixth inning was tough because he gave up a solo shot, and then all of a sudden it seemed like the wheels were coming off a little bit, but he gets a key double play and a strikeout to get out of the inning, and then he pitches well in the seventh. It was phenomenal to see, and there was a quote early on because a big – talking point that I've had a big talking point that pretty much anybody who's talked about Tyler Malley or Sonny Gray or different pitchers on the Reds roster except for like Wade Miley Wade Miley doesn't really do this but sometimes they run up their pitch counts worrying about trying to hit the corner of the strike zone and get that perfect strikeout pitch whenever they get to two strikes and because of that they work the counts full they end up walking guys that they shouldn't when really they should just be pitching to get outs and what most fans like to say is make the hitter get themselves out cowboy had a great quote about that he said making a hitter get himself out is the wrong mindset for a pitcher the correct thought process is i'm going to make the hitter hit my best pitch and Vladimir Gutierrez was fantastic at doing that on Sunday Goody was Gucci not to be outdone though Max Schrock how about that Joey misses history on Saturday gets the off day on Sunday for a little bit of rest to give him two off days back to back and Max Schrock comes in and does something that Joey Votto has never done in his career and that is get five hits in the game Now, yeah, four of them were singles, but Max Schrock was all over the place. Four singles, 
a homer off of Marcus Stroman, he really kind of showed that Marcus Stroman could be beat for the Reds because he hit that home run in the fourth, gives the Reds a one nothing lead. And then the Reds jump all over him in the sixth. They chase him after scoring two runs and getting guy two men on base. And then they bring in the bullpen guy, Miguel Castro, and he walks Vladimir Gutierrez with the bases loaded to score a run. That was phenomenal. I, I, I love the fact that the Reds were able to work that. But overall, a very calm game on Sunday for the Red Legs. They did give up the home run to McNeil. That was really the only thing that uh, hurt them at all. I mean, they, they had a fantastic game. You get great performances out of the bullpen from brand new guy, Michael Gibbons, 13 pitches, one, two, three, eighth. And then Justin Wilson in the ninth. Reds are up seven to one, and he goes one, two, three with a strikeout. We're, we're all right. The bullpen actually might be instilling a little bit more confidence with these new guys. Uh, maybe maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's nice to see in, in that game. I mentioned the five for five game for Max Schrock. His last five starts this season, he is 11 for 19. He has 11 hits in his last five starts for the Reds. I, I really like having this dude on the bench. He is great depth for the team. And he has shown a prowess from the left side. Definitely whenever Moustakis comes back. Mike Freeman will be sent down because Max Schrock is a much better left-handed bat off the bench than Mike Freeman is. But a great weekend overall for the Red Legs. They end the road trip 5-2. and two. That is how you do it. Now, not to be outdone, the Braves didn't help the Reds at all. They ended up losing two out of three to the Brewers, so the Reds didn't make up any ground. And the Padres won yesterday, so the Reds are still four back in the wild card. But there's an interesting update where it concerns the Reds in the wild card because they're chasing the Padres. Don't really know that they're going to catch the Dodgers or the Giants, whoever flip flops that in a West division race. But they have a shot to catch the Padres simply because and, and we hate to say because I don't want to see anybody injured. And I love watching Fernando Tatis play, but he's having some shoulder issues. And they said here in the coming days, they will know whether or not he needs surgery. And if he gets surgery, he's done. So that could be a huge development for the Reds in this wild card chase. We'll keep you posted. All right, coming up here, I've got uh, I've, I've got some clips of Nick Crawl talking about how he felt about the trade deadline. And I'm going to ask whether or not they did enough. We'll get into that here in just a minute. But it, it was a fantastic weekend for the Reds at the old ball yard there in New York. Love to see the fact that they were able to get some runs on Marcus Stroman because everybody was thinking going into it, they're like, oh boy, Marcus Stroman basically pitched a complete game shutout in Great American Ballpark, and the Mets ballpark is an even friendlier pitcher's park, so what are we going to have here? But the Reds were able to get up on him. Great series. And now they come back home, and they got the Twins tomorrow, and they've got the Pirates this weekend. Dare I say they've got a chance to make some hay. Maybe getting ahead of ourselves, whatever. We'll talk about the front office here in just a minute. Before we talk about that, though, I wanted to let you know that you can still set up your profile at betonline.ag with the promo code Locked On and get 50% added onto your initial deposit. BetOnline.ag is the only online sportsbook that I trust, and it's the best way to turn your sports knowledge into cash. Check out betonline.ag. Like I mentioned, set up your profile with the promo code locked on to get 50% added onto your initial deposit. And you can bet on great lines for Major League Baseball, whether it's money lines, run lines, the over under. They've got great prop bets. Like I mentioned on Saturday, even though it didn't quite work out, I try to give you a tip at each and uh, almost every day. Sometimes I don't have one today, not really feeling anything specific. But you could check it out. They've also got Olympic sports bets. If you want to bet on the Olympic, USA baseball, things like that, they've got that. You can find NFL futures there as well. BetOnline.ag has any line that you can think of. And if they don't, then you can reach out to them and ask. Check out BetOnline.ag today and set up your profile. Type in the promo code locked on, and you'll get 50% added onto your initial deposit and start making money off of your sports knowledge today. That's BetOnline.ag. And the promo code locked on. All right. 
We're going to try something new here. I've, I've got clips. I got video clips. Nick Crawl talking about the trade deadline. We're going to see if this works. So the Reds didn't do anything on the deadline day. We had our live uh, MLB trade deadline show for Lockdown MLB that I got a chance to be a part of. That was a lot of fun. But the Reds didn't give me anything to talk about specifically. There were lots of trades happening. That was probably the most exciting trade day, trade deadline day I can remember, but the Reds were not a part of it. And there were some people that were wondering, is Nick Crawl's phone even on? Is he even in the office? Is there anything going on? Nick Crawl had some thoughts on it. He gave his overall feelings on the deadline, and he has a little bit there at the end that kind of lets you know what was going on. I think we, you know, we, we tried to make our club better to see what was out there. Uh, we didn't find something that matched up. So um, we were excited to get our, our deals done earlier this week and, uh, and add the uh, three relievers to the club. A lot of phone calls, though, in the, uh, today. It's funny because he said that with such a straight face. I feel like he heard the criticisms. But as you could tell, they kind of got what they were looking for. And he was asked uh, about the execution of that. And, and he mentioned, you know, we were trying to be opportunistic, but there just wasn't any opportunities out there. So the question then leads you to believe were other teams really high on their asking price. Some teams were, were a little bit, I mean, obviously they were, they were a, a higher uh, value of, of uh, they wanted more of our system than we were willing to give up. And um, you know, or, or they wanted uh, guys off our major league team that I just, uh, I wasn't comfortable giving. I think that, uh, you know, our, our, we've got a really good clubhouse, um, really good chemistry and culture. And, uh, you know, you want to see that keep going. And, uh, you know, it just uh, we're excited to have the guys we have. I have said multiple times in the past, I feel like the Reds should be all in. They should be willing to do what is necessary to acquire the pieces that will bring a championship here to Cincinnati. I think it also deserves mentioning, though, that they need to be smart about that. And the idea that they should have went all in at this trade deadline, we'll get into the specific prices here in a minute, but it's very obvious people were calling about Nick Lodello, Hunter Green, Jose Barrero, probably Austin Hendrick and Tyler Callahan and Reese Hines and guys like that. Guys that the Reds really, and especially with like Lodello Green and Barrero, look to be huge parts of the team next year guys who can really make an impact. I don't necessarily know that that would have been a smart idea. We'll talk about that in a minute, though, because speaking of those guys, the, the question was asked, is their development and their progression and the fact that they are close to the major leagues, is that a big factor in why the Reds were quiet on the trade deadline day? I mean, from a shortstop perspective, it's great to see him take a step forward. Um, it's great to see Kyle Farmer playing really well. Um, you know, just offensively and defensively, um, you know, you've got guys like uh, Barrero and Green um, in, in AAA that, that, that are getting closer. Um, you know, you, you, you see them as, as obviously our future. And, you know, at some point they're going to be ready to come up here and, and, and be, uh, be major contributors. So um, that's exciting to have uh, players and, and prospects at AAA that you, that you feel that uh, uh, have some big upside. It's key to note that I, I firmly believe all three of those guys will be major contributors to the team next year. So if you trade any one of those guys, then that is a huge get for another team. You're talking about a generational talent in Hunter Green. You're talking about a potential, like, really long time starting shortstop in Jose Barrero. I, I don't want to put, like, all-star or anything like that on him just yet, but he has shown plenty of talent. I mean, you saw him in the Futures game. He was all over the place. You see the stats of him in AAA. He's all over the place. He is a great talent, so that would be kind of a high price to give up. So the question comes, did the Reds do enough? They addressed their major need. Now, don't get me wrong. They created that hole in the first place, so they dug a hole to put dirt back in it. Did they get much better? I, you know, when you look at a meter, like, you know, you always think of a, a meter that's like red, yellow, and green so far as like how you feeling. I'm not in the red, but I don't know that I'm in the green. I'm not like fully optimistic about the fact that they made these moves. Like, I, I like that they did. I'm, I'm firmly in the middle. I'm neutral. I think that's where we're, we're getting at here. I don't think that they made the team so much better in that you're feeling like they can take on anybody. They can do anything they want. 
but I also believe the team was talented enough already and the holes were addressed that they obviously didn't get worse. So yeah, I'm in the middle. I'm in the, let's wait and see how this all plays out, how they perform. Because we saw as the other day in extra innings, Luis Sessa giving up the game winning run and things like that. Now, that's only one game. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, the, oh, well, Luis Sessa is just going to fall right back into the pla- the pattern that Reds relievers have already set this year. But I also don't think that these guys are better than Rice Iglesias or Archie Bradley, who, by the way, I, I think, uh, and speaking of Iglesias, I think he was available, although the White Sox were the most rumored team to get him, and they went and they got Craig Kimbrell. Speaking of Kimbrell, let's talk about that because there were some there were some people thinking maybe go get another bullpen arm, maybe go get a fifth starter or a starter to put into the rotation to make this rotation complete and strong one through five. An idea for that I saw plenty of people bringing up on Twitter and and people thinking about this guy was Jose Barrios. If you saw that trade to Toronto and you thought, boy, oh boy, Toronto's really getting a dude, they really gave up a lot to get him. They gave up their number two and their number four prospect. Now that's their organizational rankings. Both guys were in the top 50 as far as, or top, uh, I think. I think the second guy was number 68, but whatever, top 70 in the nation. The uh, first guy, Austin Martin, was like the 14th ranked prospect in all of baseball. So they're number two and they're number four. What would that have been for the Reds? That would have been Hunter Green and Jose Barrero for Jose Barrios. Now, Jose Barrios does have one more year of arbitration control before he is a free agent, but that is essentially saying, and, and people at the time of the trade, weren't really sure about the deal when the Reds basically traded Taylor Trammell for Trevor Bauer in a year and a half of Trevor Bauer. Now the 60 games, that was not something that the Reds could foresee, and it's unfortunate that it happened that way. But we're talking about trading two guys who are going to be under team control and who are going to be a huge part of the franchise in Green and Barrero for Brios, who most likely... Knowing the nature of our ownership group was only going to be here a year and a half. I don't think I would have made that deal. That would have been a bad deal. And I don't know many Reds fans that would have disagreed with that. Then you look at Kimbrell. What did the White Sox have to give up for Kimbrell? They gave up a kind of nothing pitching prospect. He was like their 52nd ranked prospect or something like that. Guy lower in the system. Sure, maybe he can blossom into something, but he's not expected to. But they also gave up Nick Madrigal. We saw him earlier on in the year whenever the White Sox came to Great American Ballpark, and you couldn't get that guy out. Now he's on the IL right now, and who knows what he's going to be after he comes back from the IL. Does he lose a step? Is he fine? He's more than likely going to be fine. But comparatively, Nick Madrigal rated in their prospect system before the season as the number three guy. So there's two ways you can look at it. Either, and again, this is hypothetical. I know that there's lots of different things that change this, but if you juxtapose the Reds over the um, White Sox, and if the Cubs even were to agree to trade Kimbrell to the Reds, which I doubt they were going to ever trade anybody in division, whenever they were tearing down their entire team. But just for hypothetical sake, the Reds would either have to have trade Austin Hendrick, their number three guy, or Jonathan India and somebody like James Marinan, Marinan, I think I got that right, for Craig Kimbrell. Would you do that? No! Kimbrell's got this year and he's got a team option for 16 million that you can guarantee tank to the bank. Not even a question. The Reds were not going to pick up that team option. If for some reason they ever got Craig Kimbrell from the Cubs. So you're getting a rental and you trade it away. Either Jonathan India or Austin Hendrick. That would have been a bad deal too. Now, You're probably sitting here and saying, Jeff, you're making excuses for a team that probably could have done more. And here's the thing with trading. There's two teams involved, two teams involved. You've got the Reds who, yes, Nick Crawl may have been calling people, may have been active, may have been like, hey, what do you got? What do you want? We want to get this guy. 
what do you need? But then you've got the other team. And if the other team, like if you've ever played fantasy sports and you're trying to get this one dude off that team and this other guy knows that you want that one dude. So he's like, all right, I want like your top two best players. And you're like, you're just, you're insane. Maybe that's what Nick crawl was running into. Because when you saw some of those trades, and those aren't even all of them, there was a lot of trades that went down yesterday that you kind of looked at, like the Chris Bryant trade, the Giants gave up some pretty top prospects on that, and I understand the argument of prospects compared to proven players right now, but when you are the Reds and you constantly tell your fan base, we are a small market team, we have to grow from within, then you got to grow from within. You got to build your team through your farm system. And if you're just going to bring them up to the point where they're close to major league baseball and you trade them, what are you telling everybody? Because you're not always going, but right now the reds farm system is very top heavy. You can talk to Doug. You can talk to Doug gray about this. He's the reds farm system did not have the depth with which to trade a lot of guys from. So that's kind of why the Reds did what they did and not much more. And don't get me wrong. I don't fault them for doing let or for not doing more, but I also am not to the point where I'm like, all right, these trades make them a bona fide playoff team. They still have a lot of work to do and we'll see how this plays off. I'm at least to the point where I'm not mad about it though. So there's that. Let me know what you think of the Locked On Reds line, 513-549-0159. Maybe you think they didn't do enough. I got plenty of tweets from people on deadline day like, what is this team doing? Why are they doing nothing? They they did nothing on deadline day, but they made some trades before that, so doing nothing is incorrect. But I, I can understand your frustration with a team that kind of set themselves back the offseason before, only to kind of get back to where they were, if not maybe a step behind. We'll see how it plays out, though, because I still feel like regardless uh, of the hopeful action that we wanted them to take on deadline day that they didn't take, I still think that they are poised to make a run at that final wild card spot. I'm a little bit uh, a little bit hesitant to say that they can make a run at the Brewers, though, because the Brewers just continue to win whenever the Reds win. The only time the Brewers lose is when the Reds lose, i.e. no ground is being made up. All right, coming up here, I want to talk about last August, what the Reds have to kind of compare themselves to this August, and let's appreciate Kyle Farmer because, man, he has been, uh, and in fact, I've, I've called him a super utility player and things like that. Maybe we need to walk that back a minute. Before we get into all of that, though, I wanted to let you know that you can get into a built Bar. I've been talking about the best tasting protein bar on the market, bar none, for a while now. And if you haven't tried it already, I got a promo code for you, LOCKED15. Go to BuiltBar.com and use that code to save 15% off your next order. They've got nine amazing flavors that they continue to roll out on a daily basis, plus they add in limited flavors all day the time they had carrot cake they had blueberry they've got a lot of great stuff right now they got my favorite cherry barcia on daily rotation because they know how much i love it and they know how much i eat it and they've also got things like peanut butter brownie they've got strawberry they've got coconut they got double chocolate check them out today because with all of that great flavors they make them all with 100 real chocolate and they have less than four grams of net carbs and sugar and up to 18 grams of protein in some cases. Check it out today, BuiltBar.com, and use the promo code LOCKED15 to get the best-tasting protein bar on the market for 15% off. All right, let's finish up today's. uh, I talked a lot there in the middle segment about did the Reds do enough, but obviously that's a question that while I feel confident that they did something, we're not going to know until the end of the season because this was this was a bet on the roster that they currently have and the fact that they didn't think they had to do too much to get back to the postseason. It's, it's very evident they understood nobody wanted them to use the R word. Nobody wanted them to rebuild. Nobody even really wanted them to kind of take a step back and reload for next year. So they kind of had to do what they had to do. All right, let's talk about, so last August, uh, the Reds, they've already played a game here in August. They've got game two coming up on Tuesday as they start a two-game series with the Twins. I think it's weird that they only get to play four games against the Twins this year, but what can you do? 
two games against the Twins and four games against the Pirates this week. It's interesting to note the Reds, while they're chasing the Padres and while they're chasing the Brewers, have last August to look back on and say, I think we can do better, at least on the batting side of things. Because last August, as a team, they slashed 219, 308, and 412. Remember, this was at the heart of the point where everybody was complaining about the fact that the Reds only scored runs whenever they hit home runs. And yeah, there's a lot to that. You definitely need to score runs in other ways. You can't just rely on the home run all the time, but they also weren't getting on base. They only got on base barely over 30% of the time. That's not good. They're doing a lot better this year. They only scored 101 runs. They had 42 homers. They did strike out 237 times compared to 98 walks. And uh, randomly, this is not really a stat that you can improve on because you can't like strategically not do this, but they did hit into 26 double plays in the month of August. I do remember that very vividly because it felt like any time because the Reds didn't get on base very much, but it felt like any time they got on base, somebody was hitting a ground ball straight at a shortstop or a second baseman, and it was an easy double play. And it was very frustrating. Then you look at the pitching. Overall, a 4.02 ERA. That was bloated quite a bit by the bullpen. The bullpen in the month of August had a 4.57 ERA. There was only a couple of games in July, but when you look at the splits on baseballreference.com, it's interesting to note that they had like some insanely bad ERA in those couple of games in uh, July. But they did have 274 strikeouts to 113 walks. Starters had a 3.68 ERA. So that's kind of the baseline for the team as they head into the month of August. I think they're going to do better. The pitching might be either the same or slightly worse just because no Trevor Bauer on the team, but uh, who was obviously the best starter of that month, 2.27 ERA in 31 and two thirds innings. He had 41 strikeouts to 10 walks. Oh man, I look, I, I understand it. He, it, what's going on right now with him is very hairy and he's kind of a sore subject to talk about, but I will always remember the 2020 season and the Cy Young award that he won the only Cy Young award in Reds history. I will always remember that fondly. So far as what happens from here on out, that's whatever he's a Dodger. I'm kind of glad he's a Dodger for that reason. The best reliever in the month of August it wasn't Rice Iglesias. It's a guy who's still on the roster. Lucas Sims only gave up one earned run in nine and two thirds innings in the month of August. He had 13 strikeouts compared to five walks. And of course, the best hitter, the best hitter all year for the Reds, but the best hitter in the month of August, Jesse Winker. He was killing it, man. 369 average, 459 on base, 798 slugging. Wait, what? Did I write that right? Yeah. 798 slugging. Absolutely phenomenal. 10 homers for him in the month of August. And it's interesting to note that as we turn the calendar to August and and Joey Votto had the amazing streak and he is absolutely killing it right now, which by the way, if he continues at this, I mean, he's not going to continue at this specific pace, but if he maintains what's going on, his OPS is over 130. That was one of my bold predictions. Uh, Don't ask me about Eugenio Suarez, though. Uh, Last year, for comparison, in the month of August, Joey Votto slugged 387. Yeah, he's a lot better this year. I I, and and I want to close out today. Uh, So that's you know that's what the Reds had to look to last August compared to now. And I want to close out today with some appreciation for a man that in spring training I said, and, and maybe even the first couple months of the season as well. I said multiple times, I don't want him being the everyday shortstop. I want him being the super utility player. I want him being the dude off the bench that can do anything you need him to do because I don't think he can play every day. Kyle Farmer has been absolutely shoving those words back down my throat. He has absolutely been fantastic. In the month of July, uh, he was insane. He hit 395 with a 456 on base and a 691 slugging. He hit five home runs, and he had 13 extra base hits compared to 15 strikeouts. I put that down because I thought it was amazing because in this day and age, everybody's striking out. He struck out 15 times. He almost had as many extra base hits as strikeouts 
in the month of July. That's phenomenal to see. In fact, in the second half of this season, which I know it's not, we're not, you know, from the all-star break, we're not that far into it, only 15 games, but he has an OPS of 1,215. Yes, 1,215. Kyle Farmer, that, that's the reason people have been like, wow, why is he batting third? Why is he in the middle of the order? That's why he's been killing it. And David Bell's been paying attention in those 15 games as well. A 426 average. He has 11 extra base hits compared to nine strikeouts. He has more extra base hits than strikeouts. And he had that RBI triple yesterday that was phenomenal. He is, he's on some kind of tear. And I love the fact that he is proving all of us wrong because there wasn't too many. I mean, there were a couple. But there weren't too many people who were advocating for Kyle Farmer to be an everyday shortstop. There were a lot more of us that were super happy about a Eugenio Suarez as the shortstop. Yeah, I'm just going to leave that one out there. But uh, yeah, Kyle Farmer has been absolutely awesome. It needs to be said. There's a reason that Jose Barrero is nowhere near considered being called up anytime soon. He's been phenomenal, but you want to call him up to play every day. And there's just absolutely no reason to keep Kyle Farmer out of the lineup right now. Plus, even so right now you're saying, okay, Jeff, he's on a crazy hot streak. He's bound to come down to earth. Yes, he is, because nobody's going to be batting close to 400 for the rest of the season. I understand that. But even after he kind of has his come down a little bit, you can still look at him as a weapon against left-handed pitchers because for the season, he has 20 hits in 61 at-bats against left-handed pitchers. For a 995 OPS, almost a thousand against lefties. And this is all year long. This isn't during this stretch of amazingness that he has been putting together. This is since the beginning of the season. He is just a weapon against left handed pitchers. He has 10 home runs on the year total, which is a career high. The most before this was nine back in 2019, his first year as a red. Now he's got a new career high of 10. He's hit five home runs against lefties. Again, 61 at-bats against lefties, 241 at-bats against righties. And he's had the same amount of homers. He loves them some left-handed pitching, which is good to see. And it's going to be interesting because, and, and I'm not going to get too in-depth on this, I think we all know what's going on with our man Gino, our man A. Eugenio Suarez. Whenever Mike Moustakis and Nick Senzel comes back, there's absolutely no reason for A. Eugenio Suarez to be an everyday player. There just isn't. He has not shown any sort of propensity of improvement. I think some people have been trying their hardest to give him the benefit of the doubt. And yes, he has a big home run like he had a couple of days ago. He has a big home run once or twice a week. Other than that, he's not doing anything. He's striking out. He's he's way behind. The bat is like there in the zone and the pitch is already in the mitt on a lot of fastballs. It's not just the league's elite pitchers. It's anybody who throws a fastball over like 96, which is a lot of guys nowadays. He's having trouble catching up to that. And I just don't know that this is an aberration anymore. This is not the kind of thing that is going to just disappear and go away and he's going to be good again. I think it's got something to do with that shoulder. And the Reds have to be honest with themselves about that because whenever Moose and Senzel are back, Suarez needs to be a, well, let's see if we can get you at bats every now and then, man. But you have not been the guy that we need you to be. You haven't even been a guy that we hope that anyone else could be. And I get it. There's been people that have been kind of stretching and saying, well, you're just looking at his batting average. It's not just his batting average. He doesn't get on base. He strikes out way too much and he's got an OPS plus of 58, 58 league average is hundred. He is 42% worse than league average. And according to baseball reference, he has negative two wins above replacement. He's been taking wins away according to the metrics and, you know, it doesn't really completely transcribed of, you know, how many wins the teams has, but he has been two wins worse than a replacement level player. I think it's time for the Reds to really look this, look themselves in the mirror and say, when these guys are back healthy, Suarez, you got to figure this out. And it's not going to be by playing every single day. 
anyway, that was a really, oh, this was a fun podcast and I had to end it that way. What is wrong with me? Anyway, um, yeah, let's have some fun. We got an off day today. Red start with the twins tomorrow. Hoping to get the Locked On Twins host Nash Walker on to talk about what we can expect as the twins come to Great American Ballpark. We'll be all over it on tomorrow's podcast. Thank you so much for listening and watching to today's podcast. If you're not subscribed here on the YouTube channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button and also follow me on your favorite podcasting app. You can also follow me on Twitter at Jeff Carr with three F's and you can follow the show at Locked On Reds and save that Locked On Reds line number into your phone at 513-549-0159. That'll do it for us here today, though. Thank you so much. I will talk to each and every one of you tomorrow. (laughs) 